Hello and welcome to uh, this sound design workshop. Um, my name is David and uh, the workshop I'm giving today is the same workshop that I did at Pod UK Goes Digital at the end of May and it went quite well, or at least I hope it went quite well. And as the response was pretty good, I thought it would be interesting to, uh, and I thought it would just be a good thing to do would be to record the workshop and put it up on the internet for uh, for all to enjoy. Um, so before we get started, uh, as you can see from this delightful basic PowerPoint presentation that that I, that I made, um, if you are watching and if you can, please do wear headphones. This is going to be a sound design workshop. I'm going to be playing some uh, clips from various different things that I've made, and uh, you'll get the most out of this if you are. Um, wearing headphones. Also, probably another thing to say, there will be slides in the middle of the of the workshop and at the end uh, for questions. Obviously, you can't ask me questions. I'm talking to you. You can't talk back to me, unfortunately. Um, so I'll just skip over those. But if you do have a question, um, relate, hopefully related to the to the talk, um, drop a comment um, down below or uh, or find me on Twitter. I'll talk about that at the end and I'll drop that in the end. Um but yeah, let's 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 fire in, shall we? Um so hello. Uh my name is uh, David Devereaux. Um when I did this talk at Pod UK, I didn't have a webcam. So I put in a picture of what I looked like to make myself seem more relatable. Um obviously since that photo was taken there have been some cosmetic changes and seeing the two pictures next to each other it's it's kind of shocking but we're going to just glaze over that and fire on into the actual content of this talk. So I usually make things under the name of Tin Can Audio. Initially that started out um being just me making noises on my own but it's kind of grown now and and it's kind of a it's a very loose collective of people that come together and and make stuff, make audio fiction and and music and and, and things. Um so initially it was just me and my first show Tin Can was was initially all me. It's just it's a science fiction um science fiction space story and that started out as um, me wanting to play around with sound design and experiment with sound design and see what I could do and um, initially started out as like a tech demo kind of thing but then people actually listened to it <laughs> and then I had to make more and it turned into to its to this this big this big kind of space opera story um, we then made middle below this is more of a kind of ensemble cast and uh, the idea behind that was what if you took the writing and performance of, of doctor who and put it in the sort of sound design and sort of nightmarish world of of the silent hill games and we kind of ended up slightly more doctor who than silent hill but in, in a way that i think works um and so that was our that was our second show. Our third show is is uh, it's called the Tower. It is a audio fiction concept album. Stay with me here. Um, with the t so I started out as a musician before I came to audio fiction, and since I started making audio fiction, I've always been interested in that area where narrative storytelling and uh, music overlap. And with the Tower, I was trying to push that and see see kind of explore that, that that gray area and it's probably out of all the things I'm going to talk about today it's probably the thing I'm the most proud of and it's it's the thing that I think is is kind of closest to my heart in terms of projects um we also have a folk lore, which is a collaboration we did with in the works which is a spoken word theater company um based in Glasgow and that was a set of queer horror stories that are set in Glasgow and that was a very different kind of of experience for me because uh first of all it was working with other writers which was a new experience for me at the time um but also it was it was taking spoken word poetry and turning that into audio fiction and really playing around with the imagery and um and the the kind of emotion of a of a poem and turning that into audio fiction which is really interesting uh we're hoping to make more of those but right now uh, we've we've just got a, a set of three episodes that um i feel like i don't talk about enough so um, point one to take away from this talk. Go and listen to Folk Store, please. Um, and our latest, uh, our latest audio fiction show, um, which we released on the day of Pod UK, um, Pod UK goes digital. So technically, saying it's out today is still technically true. Um, is the Dungeon Economic Model, which is a mix of um, 
uh, Dungeons and Dragons and uh, UK post-war public information films. Um, it's very silly. It's kind of mad, and and um, it's great. We're currently in the midst of of releasing that. Um, I also worked for a year as the editor of Stella Firma, which is a show by Rusty Quill. Um, I worked with, uh, I kind of came in halfway through season one and then left about halfway through season two uh, before um, the wonderful Maddie Sorrell took over uh, as 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 editor. Um, and that was, I, I learned a lot editing Stella Firma. I'll kind of talk about that a little bit later on, but um, that was a year long learning experience. And I was very proud of my work with with, with, with Stella Farmer and, and and it seemed seemed to do very well. So that was nice. And also uh it's it's less to do with sound design, um, but uh more just for sort of C V purposes is how I describe it. Uh the end of last year and start of this year, I worked with BBC Sounds and BBC Cymru Wales on a uh series called Murmurs. I directed two episodes um and also got to work with some fantastic writers and actors. Um but I didn't do the sound design, so I can't talk about that uh, in relation to this. I'll be playing clips from um, most of the, the, the shows listed um, today just so um, I can properly talk about what went into each um, each clip and, and how it relates to what we want to talk about. But what do I want to talk about? Well, uh, today I would like to talk about active sound design. So um, I when I'm making sound is when I'm doing sound design um I separate it into kind of two different kinds of sound design so the the I'll be mostly talking about uh, uh active sound design here but I feel like I should I'll kind of talk about passive as well um passive sound design is 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 non-interactive it's it's the background stuff it's it's atmosphere it's it's what's around what's around the uh the the, the vocals it's it's the bed I guess Whereas active sound design is, is is different from that. It's it's interactive. It's um, things that happen in real time um, while the scene is happening. So people picking stuff up, people putting stuff down, people walking around, um, things being punched, uh, somebody having a drink. It's it's the sounds that happen within a space. So if you think that the if you think passive design is is the bed, um, active sound design is the stuff you interact with in the bed. So like the pillows and and, and the sheets and and uh, your partner if you're into that sort of thing. Um and that's the kind of difference between passive and and and, and active sound design. To kind of give you an idea, uh, I'm going to give a very quick example. This is the opening of episode nine of of my first show, Tin Can, and uh, it has both passive and active sound design. And I'm going to play the clip, and then um, I'm going to uh, talk about the difference between between the two. quite strange feeling watched while you, while you're playing sound clips anyway um so th that that sounds very busy and it sounds like there's a lot going on but um if we separate that out into passive and active sound design um you have the passive sound design which is the bridge ambience which sounds like this so it's kind of a, a low hum when it decides it wants to play again so it's like a low hum um and then you've got a couple of beeps um just to kind of give it that more of a kind of bridge sound, um, whereas the, that's the passive sound design. Whereas the active sound design is the the, the typing sounds or the the, the readout um, sounds that happen with the typing. It's it's the sound. It's what's actually happening in the scene. It's stuff that's changing. Um, the that kind of readout sound, if you're interested, was a broken cash machine that I walked past while I was on my way home one night from work. Um, I I kind of heard it and I happened to have my little portable recorder, uh, which I've got right here, actually, um, my little portable recorder on me. So I kind of went up to the, the cash machine and put my coat around it to keep the wind out and then and then recorded it. I don't know what it must have, it must have looked very strange on the CCTV, but, um, but nobody's kind of called me out on it. So I think we're fine. Um, so that's that's the a kind of demonstration between the difference between passive and active um, sound design. 
So today specifically I want to talk about the principles of active sound design. Now that sounds kind of scary and it sounds kind of complicated, but it's it's really not. Um, before I talk about what the principles of active sound design are, uh, I'm going to tell you what they're not. So uh, the principles of active sound design are not hard and fast rules, which I guess technically means they're not principles. Um, when I came to putting together this workshop, uh, I kind of figured if I did a very technical workshop where I opened up a project file and kind of talked you through all the um, very specific processes that I went through, I, f I felt like that would be uh, very technical and I feel like that would go completely over the heads of some people, whereas being very patronizing to others and and kind of seemingly blindingly obvious to, to some other people. Um, so I thought the more useful thing to do would be to talk about how I approach sound design or, and, and, and the questions I ask myself and the things that I consider and the things I think about when, when I'm, I'm, I'm designing a scene. So as much as I'm calling these principles, they're, they're not really principles. Uh, these are just things that I think about when I'm doing some, when I'm designing a, a scene in, in a piece of audio. And these are kind of questions and ideas that uh, I hope you will take into your own sound design and uh, hopefully hopefully inspire you to um, think a bit more um, imaginatively or, or at the very least help clarify how sound design works just a little bit if you're if you're a little bit um, confused by it and it can be very confusing it was it was very confusing to me when I when I started um, so principle number one is using sound design, using active sound design visually. Um, so I came to audio fiction from filmmaking. So I, when I was at university, I fell in with a group of people that, that wanted to make films. And initially I started making music for these films. And then I kind of naturally gravitated towards sound design and, and doing the sound design for, for short films and for filmmaking. And then bef when I kind of, left university that that was kind of my main um job as a sound designer um was was doing stuff for film and i think working in such a visual um environment and working for working in a medium where you can see everything and you have to represent what you're seeing in sound i think is is was very helpful when it came to um making sound design uh, when i'm making audio fiction rather um so this first principle is is more of just is, is just a set of questions to ask yourself when you uh, when you start designing a scene, and this is kind of a good first step, I think, because it it it's basically you're designing the space around what's happening, and I think the better you can visualize a space and the better you can visualize a scene, um, the better your sound design will be. So the first question is kind of obvious. Um, the first question is uh, where is the scene? Is it indoors? Is it outdoors? Um, if it's outdoors, are they on a street? Are they in a field? Uh, are there cows? Um, if it's inside, if, if the scene is taking place indoors, um, how big is the room? Is the room empty? Are, are, is there anything in the room that would absorb sound? Is is there, uh, are there windows? What's the carpet? You know, is there carpet or is it, or is, or is it just wooden floors? These are all... Um, questions to ask yourself and and a lot of this a lot of this will will, will not be included in a, in a script um and and quite a lot of time these details will not be useful to you when um when you're trying to make a scene but by asking yourself these questions you are building a space visually in your head and if you know everything that's in a room or if you know exactly what a space looks like you'll be able to to better design that space so the second uh, second question, God, this PowerPoint. I apologize. Uh, the second question is: Where are the characters? Do they move? What you're trying to avoid uh, is the, what you're trying to avoid your 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 um, audio fiction sounding like is two floating heads, um, kind of spinning around each other like binary stars, imparting information at each other. Um, you know, is one character the, 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 this? You know, with with this one, it's it, it's questions like you know, is one character sitting down, is another standing up? Um, do they switch places? Are, are they facing each other? Is one person facing away? Um, 
do they move about? So the, 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 this is kind of stuff like footsteps and 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 actions and and, and things as well. Um, but what I suggested, I think I talked about at Pod UK when 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 I was doing this workshop was a video by um, Nerdwriter, where he analyzes a scene from Vertigo where it's two characters talking, um, but throughout the scene the characters move in such a way and their positions change in such a way that affects who is in control of the conversation and it affects the kind of power dynamic of the scene. While stuff like that will be harder to render in audio, keeping it in mind um, will just help you make your scenes feel more alive. And again, it's all about, again, this is stuff that will not be, will often not be in a script or will not be important, but Keeping it in mind just means that you'll have a better idea of what the scene looks like. Um, as you are kind of overloading yourself with detail, but the, the the reason why you're doing that is so you can communicate that to your to your listener. Uh, the next question is: What objects are in the room? Where are they? You know, if if somebody is sitting down, where is the chair? What is the chair made out of? Does the chair creak? Um, and where are these objects in 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 space, uh, in in the space? This can also extend to things that won't be interacted with or don't even make noise. Uh, what what I like to imagine is: Are there any pictures on the wall? You know, um, again, just adding that extra bit of visual detail to a scene to help you think about it when you're designing a sound. Something I really like to do uh, in very static rooms, like like my office, I guess, um, to really just add that extra little bit of um, character to a scene is to add a clock. Um, if you just have a clock ticking, um, it makes a scene just feel that little bit more lived in um, and that little bit more real. And knowing where these objects are in relation to uh, uh, characters um, is very important, and I'll demonstrate that in a, in a clip in just a second. Um, the final question, this one is probably the least important, but it's one I always really like um, to ask myself because I think it can really transform the way a scene sounds, is what's outside the room or what's outside the scene? You know, if a scene takes place indoors, what's the weather like outside? Is it is it windy? Is it is it rainy? Are there trees? Is there wind blowing through the trees? Um if it's windy, is it rattling the windows? If it takes place in a flat, what's going on in the other rooms? What's going on in the hallway outside? Again, these details will most likely not be in a script and a lot of the time will not be useful to you. But knowing that, knowing what's outside the scene will just help you make the universe that you are creating just that extra little bit more real. And that's kind of what you're trying to do. You're trying to make something feel real and alive in, in, in sound design. Um, so I'm going to play a clip now. Uh, I'm going to play a clip from Stella Firma Season 1, Episode 23. So this um, this is the end of an episode. And it's kind of a demonstration of the third question, what objects in the room and where are they? Um, and I'll play the clip and then um, I'll talk to you about, um, and then I'll kind of explain it and take it apart a little bit. When it decides to play. Uh, just hang on. I think I've got something here. Okay, just look at this. It's a sort of a flat plane. Yes. Highly polished. Yes. Almost glass-like, but yes. there's a some sort of silver backing. Oh, who's that fellow? Oh, yes, who is oh, it? Hello? They waved at me when I waved. It's a friend. Wait, they're copying me. You think you're so funny, don't you? You're mocking me, aren't you? You come in! Ah! Ah, ah my hand! I punched it and it was a mirror! Okay, Trek, so that, that wasn't a trick. That was, ah. was just literally holding up a mirror. My hand is bleeding now. That's not some kind of like... Where did they go? Well, that's not a mirror, Trek. So that's not like Trex or spelt with a Y or something. Where did they go? They, they they smashed a mirror over my hand and then went away. No, you smashed the... You come back here, mirror me. Well, maybe mirror... So, uh, the... The the thing about that scene is 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 the mirror. The, the about that clip is is the mirror is what I'm wanting to talk about. So, the important thing to note there is that the object is audibly introduced before it's interacted with, or if it's spoken about. So, you know, you hear David Seven picking up the mirror before Trexel describes it, and then after it gets smashed, you hear David Seven put it down again. Um, what doesn't happen is that a mirror suddenly appears, it gets punched, and then it disappears again. Um, you're kind of 
trying to trick the listener into thinking that the mirror has always been there, that the mirror has always been there. They just didn't notice it. Um, the mirror exists within the space. And uh, it, it's kind of, it's sort of a, a weird, not the opposite of the Chekhov's gun principle, but it's kind of a weird variation on it. So the Chekhov's gun principle is a, is a principle in writing where if you write or it's pointed out that there is a gun on the wall, then at some point that gun is going to be fired at some point later on in the narrative. Uh, the sound design version, um, if you have the sound of a gun being fired, at some point before, you're going to have to have the sound of somebody taking the gun off the wall. So you want objects to, to exist in the space before they are interacted with, before they're spoken about, or at the very least tricking your listener into thinking that they have. Um, and that comes from thinking visually uh, and, and uh, yeah, thinking visually and knowing exactly what is in a space at all times. Um, and that's something that will grow as you design the scene. Um, obviously, when I started editing that episode, I didn't know that there was a mirror in the room uh, until I got to the end. But um, when I got there, it was it added to my picture of the room. And then I thought, right, where is that mirror in relation to everything else? Where where does it sit um, for the for the whole episode when when they're not talking about it or interacting with it? Um, so that's principle number one: using active sound design uh, visually. Um, I'm going to move on just a second. So we're going to principle number two, which I call zoom and enhance. Um, but the kind of, I guess the kind of more formal way of saying it is using active sound design to create emphasis. And uh, I'll kind of add a little bit more to this in, in the next one. But uh, um, this is a very simple question. The, 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 it's a very straightforward question. And the, the, the question is, how can I make this scene more effective with sound design? A lot of time, a lot of the time, this will come from the script. You'll have specific sound effects that you're wanting to use, um, but it's also about taking the sound effects that are there, that are in the script, and seeing if you can make them more effective. Uh, the, the, the best way I can kind of talk about this is by talking about comedy, um, because in comedy you're just trying to make something funnier, which is which seems slightly easier to quantify. Uh, and, and an example is, again, from Stella Firma, um, and it's, it's the Stella Firma sheep. So this is from an episode of season two. I can't remember which one. But uh, what happened at the end of the episode was that a chattel, I'm trying to remember this right, a chattel of um, electric sheep were created um, and kind of released to be eaten by the client of that episode. And the reason they were being created to be eaten was so that the client didn't eat David Seven and Trexel. Stay with me. Um, so these sheep are being created and they're, you know, running free for the first time, immediately being eaten straight away. They're being created to be to be eaten. And the uh, technically this is David Seven's idea, but he feels immediately guilty about it almost straight away. Um, and initially it was just going to be, you know, your bog standard sheep sound effects. Um, but I thought, well, there's an idea to make there's an idea to make this funnier. So I went to Tim Meredith, who is who is a wonderful creative firework, and uh, and asked if he wanted to do this idea, and he agreed, and and it worked. So I'll play the clip, and then I'll talk about it a bit more. Oh, it's lagging again. <laughs> I say sheep, but there's definitely some cows in that sound effect. Uh, so yeah, we we gave we gave the sheep some voices, and that was uh, that wasn't complicated at all. That was just me in front of my microphone doing a slightly bad sheep impression, um, yelling existential torment at David Seven, um, and that's just a little touch that just adds an extra bit of humor to that sound effect to that moment in 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 the episode and and what it does is it it makes david seven's guilt seem much deeper because <laughs> these these uh 
these sheep are asking David Seven why <laughs> why they're being eaten. Um, so what you're kind of looking for there is is what I'm trying to demonstrate there uh, is that little tweaks and these these tiny little additions can go a very very long way. You're kind of looking to add pauses or maybe additional actions or just you know keeping an eye on or keeping an ear I suppose um, on what's going on in a scene and if there's any way to to add a bit of extra movement or color or, or humor to a scene and uh, uh, a kind of example of of really transforming a scene with just a couple of little tweaks is from uh, middle below season one episode four and um, this is two characters Heather and, and Alex uh, talking in, 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 in their flat. You want anything from the shop? What? Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm good, thanks. Actually, could I get... Actually, no, n- never mind. Okay. Alex? Yes? Could you get me a pack of cigarettes, please? So that's just... That's just one sound effect. We added one sound effect, which is the the repeated opening and, and, and closing of a bedroom door. And um, what it does is it takes a scene that's kind of that is slightly you know slow and and um, not particularly interesting. Uh, it takes a bit of dialogue that's not particularly interesting and just gives it a bit of rhythm and and a bit of extra character to the scene. And it it also adds a bit of extra personality to the characters. Um, it gives a bit of extra personality to Heather and Alex, and also a bit of a bit of um, insight into their relationship, with just one sound effect, just with 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 just this door opening and closing. And on another level, that's a visual joke, which that's a visual joke, which links back to 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 part one. Um, knowing, so I, I grew up watching Mr. Bean and um, Faulty Towers, and learning that kind of style of physical acting and, and visual storytelling can just add another uh add another arrow to your to your quill I, I i've forgotten the expression um just just adds an extra bit of of um knowledge to your to your kind of storytelling palette i guess um being able to think visually and translate that into sound um is a very powerful tool. Um, and there are some great examples in, in audio. Uh, the kind of classic example is the, the Goon Show, where they actually do slapstick sequences, but in a, on the radio, you know, they, they do these slapstick. And that's all down to timing and, you know, taking the audience's expectations and or taking the mental picture that the, the uh, listener has got in their mind and then subverting it. And it's a very, very good example. Another good example, which is slightly more recent, uh, is uh, uh, Bleak Expectations. It's, it's another BBC um, show. But they use sound design to do slapstick, slapstick sequences, but they also use sound design to, to create jokes in itself. And uh, so if you're kind of not quite sure of what I'm talking about, I highly recommend going and looking at those. I think they both get repeated on, uh, on BBC radio quite a lot. I think they are I think they are on BBC Sounds, but um, I'm not 100% sure of that. So that's that's uh, that's principle number 2. Um, principle number 3 is using active sound design as a character. Um, and I'd say this is probably the most important part of of the talk. I think if there is anything uh, if there's one kind of principle out of all of these that you take away from them, um, this is the one you should take away. Um, and it's it's make the sound design an active participant in the scene. Um, with so many, I think before I kind of came to audio fiction, before I was in work, I came to independent audio fiction specifically, um, my experience of radio drama had been listening to the afternoon play on BBC Radio 4 on long car journeys. Um, and not to, you know, denigrate them or anything like I understand that they they have time restraints and and all sorts of things but the sound design was very much you know you had you had the voices here and then you had like a a kind of ambience track there and 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 that was it you know you sort of you you, you had two characters standing in a field and then you had uh the sound bed and that was it that was all the sound design that happened 
um the sound design was underneath um the 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 um underneath the dialogue and i think a lot of that is 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 part of the reason why people kind of write off audio fiction because it's not interesting to listen to <laughs> um whereas when i when i discovered you know hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy the the radio series of hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy and and did a kind of deep dive into into audio fiction independent audio fiction i kind of found that you know this is how you do sound design this is how you do this is how you tell stories with sound um and you know making sound design an active participant in the scene can can take a number of different forms it can be subtle like the kind of two principles that we've already talked about already or it can go completely the other way and you have uh, a a you know audio set pieces um like uh, this particular set piece which is from the first episode of uh, middle below which is um which takes place in a haunted arcade i'll just play the clip and then we'll talk about it uh, when it decides to load how did you get past the haunted arcade machines the what Oh, no. oh, yes, there's definitely someone else here. Thank you, Gil. <laughs> Gil, is it? Yep, it's definitely malevolent. What do we do? I say we do what it says. Run! Let's go. Let's go. Gil, can you open it up from the other side? I can't open doors. I'm a ghost. Gil! Okay, okay. So that particular um, piece was designed to be this big set piece. Um, And the kind of advantage I had was that I was also writing that show. And so I, I kind of write with the sound design in mind. Um, but I think whether you are a writer or, or a sound designer, um, you have, with with sound design and with audio fiction, you have this opportunity to be inventive. Um, if you're a writer and you know, you're know you writing a bit of audio fiction, consider what you can do with sound. Um, consider the possibilities of it. Um, if you have a sound designer in mind, talk to them, um, ask them questions. If you have a sound designer that, you know, if you know a couple of sound designers, talk to them. Um, if you have ideas, you want to do a set piece, you want to do a space battle. Um, a lot of the time, sound designers will be like, yes, please, that sounds amazing. Um, but even if, if, you know, you don't know any sound designers at that point when you're writing something and you... Uh, you you know you have a specific um, idea for something you want to do. Um, don't worry about spelling it out. The the kind of two approaches that I have seen is that the writers describe the action, or they describe the sounds that they want to hear, or they 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 say it sounds like this. Um, if the right if as a sound designer if I get a script through and they've written down. Uh, at this point, there's, uh, uh, I don't know, um, the space battle. Or, and they describe the space battle. I'll go, yes, amazing. It's, you know, it's a clean slate. I can take my own ideas and references and, uh, and, and put them into this scene and be very creative and kind of have a lot of creative freedom with that. Um, whereas with the other, the other kind of approach where um, I get a script through and they have very specific sounds where it's like it's a space battle, the, 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 the guns sound like this particular episode of Star Trek uh, or, or they sound or the, 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 the spaceship engines sound like we fix space junker and that kind of thing. I, I get that script and I go, yes, amazing. They, they know exactly what they want. That, that means I can get that. I can listen to that and I know exactly how to approach this scene. So don't worry about under explaining or over explaining. Um, it is very much down to uh, how how specific you you are hearing it in your head. Um, if you're a sound designer, and I hope there are writers watching this, by the way, um, I hope that this is proving useful so far. Uh, well, if you're a sound designer, 
and you know you're going through a script and you 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 kind of have um an idea to make this a kind of scene be like well i think um i think we have an opportunity i have an opportunity to do something here i can add something talk to the writer talk to your director and 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 see what they think you know with with the 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 stella firma sheep um i just dropped tim meredith who's the showrunner dropped him a message and i kind of said well like i've had this idea to give i think it'll be funnier if we add voices to the sheep and and he, he said yes that's an excellent idea um and 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 add it so i think so be inventive be creative and and kind of be brave as well kind of push yourself to 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 um try something a bit more more experimental you know sound is this unconstrained playground when it comes to audio fiction you know the 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 special effects budget is the listener's imagination you know you can do so much with very little um probably my kind of um favorite example of this uh is that um we uh it, when we a lot of people find this, ooh what have i done a lot of people find the 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 sound of rain very relaxing and what what we think is the reason why we found find the sound of rain relaxing uh is because when we lived in caves if it was raining outside it meant that there was less there were less chances of predators being about so we kind of instinctively associate that sound with safety and that's like part of the reptile brain from you know millions of years ago and sounds carry images sounds carry ideas and that's a very powerful tool to have when you're trying to tell a story um with sound an example is uh from the the tower so the tower takes place spoilers on a tower and um this massive tower that's based on the the tower of babel and in the last episode of the series um the main character kiri lights a beacon and it and it it, it activates all this ancient machinery that hasn't um hasn't moved for centuries it suddenly becomes alive and starts churning again um and so you know it's this huge mega structure you know um it's lots of giant stone cogs and and lots of things suddenly moving and uh this is what it sounds like So that's two sounds. Um, yeah, that's 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 just two sounds. Um, the 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 first sound is um, when I. So uh, a couple of summers ago, I worked in a school uniform shop, which I could spend a lot of time talking about, but I'm not going to here. Uh, don't ever work in a school uniform shop if you can help it. It's it's not it's not not fun. But the. Um, the shop that I was working in, the the metal shutter at at the front of the shop, um, was broken, and uh, so every morning somebody had to climb up a ladder, and and you know manually crank the 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 shutter, so that it would it would go up, and uh, I remember listening to it, hearing it one day, and going, "Ooh, that's an interesting sound. I I, I want that." So uh, a couple of days later, I went in with my um, excuse me, I went in with my my portable recorder and uh and and a poor other member of staff had to climb up a ladder and and um crank the crank the shutter up and i took that sound uh i think i lowered the 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 pitch of it by i think about eight decibels maybe an octave um and then uh added the sound of a, a a mill like a flour mill kind of grinding and um and then we just added a bit of reverb and that's that's it with with two sounds you've created this massive structure you've created this huge machine um and it's it's all down to how the listener interprets it and um just from those sounds and that's a very powerful idea and it's a very powerful tool when it comes to comes to storytelling the 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 sound design should be you know between the dialogue it shouldn't just be um underneath it you know um Sound designers are storytellers. 
especially in audio fiction and and it's it's something that that uh, I feel like a lot of sound designers don't consider themselves storytellers. They consider themselves engineers or they consider themselves, you know, just part of the post-production team. But, you know, there's sound design has an important role to play, especially in audio fiction, um, when it comes to to telling a story. Uh, and an example, I'm going to play you a clip from the first episode of Tin Can. This is the first bit of audio fiction I ever made. Um, and, and I wanted to... Um, and I wanted to demonstrate what I could do with sound design or what was possible for me to do with sound design. Um, so, and, and you know, I didn't, I, I hadn't really made anything like this before. So I just made it entirely by myself. I'm the only speaking voice in that episode, which I'm, I guess I'm still apologizing for. Um, but, uh, but I realized that if I wanted to make the story dynamic and I wanted this to make the story interesting, I had to make the sound design interact with the character. And uh, here's a little clip and uh, I'll kind of talk a bit more about it afterwards when it starts playing. The bad news is that because the sensors are down, I can't tell if there's been a hull breach or not. So there could be a big hole on the other side of this door Wish me luck. Retroactively. <sighs> Computer, restore shipwide oxygen levels to normal. Specify. Alright. Computer, restore oxygen levels between the bridge and the sensor station. Oh, not even there, huh? Computer, adjust life support to follow my signal. Oh, of course. Senses are down. Um, computer, adjust life support, bridge, section 01, 50%. So, the sound design in that clip is as important as the dialogue. For moving the story along, um, the 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 beeps were were made with a just like a tone generator, I think, and but you 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 kind of instinctively know what those sounds mean, what a badoop and a boo sounds like. <laughs> um, you know what those sounds connotate, and you know the sound design there tells the story, um, and that's kind of what I'm trying to do with this principle here is what I'm trying to communicate with this um, uh, principle. It's the sound design is, is is more than background, or it should be more than background noises. It, it's it's an additional storytelling tool. Um, it's the difference between audio fiction and audio books. Uh, in audio books, you have somebody, you know, sitting giving you all the information, reading. Whereas with audio fiction, you have the opportunity to cut that back to show and not tell which is a very very like it's probably the most important storytelling principle is to show don't tell and this is how you do it in audio by by using sound design and that's advice for writers and sound designers um if you are a writer think about how sound can help you tell your story and if you're a sound designer think about how you can add your own narrative voice to everything you're working on to a story that you're editing, to a scene that you're editing. Um, if you are a sound designer, you are a storyteller. And and I think once you um, internalize that idea, you will approach sound design as a storyteller and you'll approach it in a much more creative way. And I think we always need more creative sound design. Creative sound design makes me very happy if you hadn't uh, worked that out already. Um, so this is the point where I would take an intermission and ask if there are any questions so far. Um, so now's a good time to remind you that if you have any questions, um, feel free to leave them in the comments section of this video uh, and uh, smash the like button. I don't know, I'm, I've, I'm not very good at YouTube. Um, if you would like a break, now is a good time to pause the video uh, and grab yourself a drink or anything. I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to keep going on with this talk uh, rather than do this weird intermission bit that I seem to be doing. Um, 
So, principle number four. Welcome back, if you paused. Uh, welcome back. Thank you for coming back. Thank you for not clicking away and watching something else. Um, principle number four. Uh, principle number four is using active sound design to make passive sound design less passive. I couldn't think of anything clever. So, something that I think we all need to acknowledge as sound designers, as people who make audio fiction, as podcasters, um, is that ambiences are kind of easy. You know, you want to sound like you're on a spaceship, you record your boiler for two minutes, or you record your washing machine for a minute and a half, stick a low-pass filter on it. Spaceship, you can just stick that under everything. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, passive sound design is background. It's, you know, it's the sounds that you ignore. Excuse me. It's the sound that your um, your brain automatically filters out. Um, but passive sound design and in particular ambiences are an opportunity to apply everything I've told you about so far. You know, using sound design as a character, thinking visually, um, adding little touches that can really um, enhance a story, enhance a scene. Um, an example, I'll, I'll give you an example and then I'll talk about it a bit more because I feel like this is easier to talk about after giving an example. So uh, this is from Tin Can episode five. So this in this scene, you have two characters in a lift. Um, they're on a space station and they're in a lift coming from the ship into the space station. And the scene starts in the lift and then transitions into the uh, space station concourse. And uh, this is what it sounds like when it decides it's going to load any second now. Tash, please. Just trust me a little while Jim longer. Reynolds, please report to the simulation lab. Okay. Welcome to the Nullius Independent Station. <laughs> the Nullius Independent Station is not affiliated with the Space Terran Union or the Guild. Where are we heading? Simulation labs. Apparently the test pilots out here are pretty talented. Ship, solid We're getting a lab tech to fly the riding. Not quite, no. Captain Bronte. Oh boy. Be nice. So what I would, what I wanted to do there was was the, the the image I had in my head for this kind of space station was that it was this busy, um, busy kind of metropolitan uh, space station. Uh, I, I the the image I had in my mind was Glasgow Central Station. If if anyone is interested in specifics, um, and that that particular that particular thing is again it's two sounds. So uh, the 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 kind of main sound is uh, it's I I was in I was actually in Glasgow Central Station with my handy dandy little recorder, and um, I think it was a Sunday or something because I managed to find five minutes where there weren't any trains leaving, and there weren't any tannoy announcements. So you have five minutes of this of of lovely kind of this lovely airy space. Um, with people moving around and people talking and, and you you can hear people running to catch a train or, or stuff. And I really think it, it makes, it gives you an idea of space and that this, it gives you a sense of a space that is alive. Um, and that would have been enough. That, that I, I almost very much left it there. But then I thought, well, we have an opportunity here to do something interesting. So I thought, well, there's no tannoy announcement, so why don't we make some? So I, I asked my, my, my friend Rosie to, uh, to, to come in and we spent uh, maybe like a, a few hours coming up with tannoy announcements and recording them. And then uh, we added them to the, to the ambience and we added them to the lift as well because it, it allowed us to kind of cover a, a scene transition. So the reason why that scene transition sounds so smooth is because you've got um, the, the, the link of the tannoy announcements. But what the Tannoy announcements do is they 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 make the the space station concourse feel lived in. They they make it feel like it, it's it's a place where people are coming and going, and it feels busy and it feels alive. What you're trying to do with your passive sound design is is trying to again trick the listener to a certain extent, trick the listener into believing that this space existed before they got here, that this space has always existed, ex always existed, and. They're just getting to it now. So, you know, you're trying to avoid, you know, the listener entering a scene and the sound design appears. You're, you're trying to make it, you're trying to make it sound like this space existed before the listener got there. Um, 
ambiences are often reused over a whole series. So be creative with them and and and, and make them make them yours and and make them something you're proud of because you're going to be listening to it a lot and and believe me I know uh, I the, for for Tin Can I uh I made some ambiences for 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 Tin Can and then I had to use them for nearly every episode and 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 there's there's like a slight hiss with one of the noises and and it drove me mental um so make sure you're proud of your your ambiences um you can also use them to, for world building. Um, you can use sound design to, to add these subtle touches to your passive sound design um, to just to add a little bit of extra world to uh, to a scene. Uh, an example here is is uh, some passive sound design from the tower. So, excuse me. So uh, I feel like this one's better if I just play it for you um, and then and then I'll explain it for you. So this is this is one sound. Technically it's just one sound. Um it's me. Uh I spent uh an afternoon sort of in front of my microphone going <sighs> making making wind noise, breathing all over the microphone basically. Uh and, and and making some wind noises. And what I did was I kind of compiled them all together and um made them a bit wispy, made them a bit sort of more kind of ambisonic and um turned it into the living wind and what what's what it does is when you're listening to the tower it, it adds an element to the space it makes the tower feel slightly more slightly more ethereal and slightly more um haunted almost so you have this story taking place but all the time you're surrounded by this sound that almost feels like it could be alive and f and and kind of ghostly and and makes this makes the very kind of quiet environment of the tower just that little bit more um spooky i guess um so passive sound design tends to get forgotten passive sound design tends to be the thing that you know it's uh, it's it's done after the first episode and then it's just copy and paste for the rest of time um but taking a little bit of extra time at the beginning of the process and, and, and making the sound design and, and making it real and, and making it alive and making it feel like a space that is, that is lived in and has a slight bit of grime under the fingernails, um, it can really make your sound design pop. It can really make your story um, much stronger and much more resonant. Um, so that's, that's principle number four. So move on now to principle number five this is the last one we're nearly there i promise uh it's called balance um but the kind of technical way of describing it is uh using the right amount of of active sound design so this is this is a difficult one to describe because a lot of this will come from experience um but the basic gist is try not to overdo it um the one thing that is worse than not enough sound design is is too much uh and that is a fine line to 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 walk on and and the thing about trying not to overdo it it's 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 a it's a difficult lesson and i think you know and i'm guilty of it i'm guilty of this myself a, a lot um i uh i approach sound design from the perspective of a musician who is also a bit of a show-off not an ideal uh, uh mindset when it comes to to sound design um and uh when I was making my, my kind of early shows, like Tin Can and Middle Below specifically, I was writing, I was the writer and the sound designer, so I didn't really have to report to anyone. Um, I just kind of made the thing, made it how I wanted, and I did the things that I wanted to do. And that's fine, but there comes a point where you're going to overdo it. You're going to overstep the mark. And I learned a lot about balance from working for Rusty Quill and, and, and working on Stella Firma. Uh, I said earlier about going to, to 
Tim Meredith with an idea. That happened a lot where I'd kind of have an idea for something. I'd go to Tim and say, I've had this idea to do this and, and, and really kind of push the envelope. And, uh, and Tim being like, yes, that's an excellent idea. Yes, let's do that. Yes, yes, do that. Absolutely, absolutely wonderful idea. And, uh, and then I'd put it in, I'd put it in, I'd t- spend hours on it. And then I'd uh, send it off and then I'd get then I'd get uh, get it sent back by Alex Newell, who kind of had final say and kind of being like, well, if you're doing this, then it means you have to do this later on or you can't do this because this cancels out this. This doesn't work. This is too much. Dial it back. So if you listen to Stella Firma and you'd like an analog for this, for this, imagine that you have uh, uh, on your on your left shoulder, um, Tim Meredith telling you to push yourself to do more, you know, throw everything at it. Um, whereas on your on your right shoulder you have um, Alex Newell being like, ah, let's just let's just take it back a bit. Let's just dial it back and see if this is see if this is uh, uh, really the right thing to do. Um, a kind of example of balance, uh, and it's it's hard to find exam- concrete examples of this because you're talking about I'm talking about what things could have been. Or rather than than what things are, rather than the end result, um, without having two specific examples of the same thing, it's hard to demonstrate. But I'll, I'll play this clip from um, the Dungeon Economic Model. Uh, this is from episode six of the Dungeon Economic Model, and um, I'll play the clip and then I'll talk about what I wanted to do and uh, why that would have been a mistake. In some instances, it would be easier to create a mystique around a dungeon than others. For example. If in creating your dungeon you are utilizing a formerly unused historic building, such as a castle, manor or tower, you should be able to use some of the former history. Did the former lord die under mysterious circumstances? Did the strange lights and sounds emanate from the wizard's tower? Was the castle previously home to a practitioner of the dark arts or very rude light arts? So when I got the the recording, when Roger's voiceover recording through for that particular bit, I wanted to make all those things. I wanted to 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 make, you know, uh, a, a lord dying under mysterious circumstances. I wanted to have some strange sounds emanating from a tower. I wanted to have a dark wizard and and a very rude light wizard. Um, but the the thing about that particular moment is that the the, the scripts and the performance are enough in this example. It, it doesn't need that amount of emphasis. If I if I added all of those um, all of those sounds, it would have overloaded the viewer, or the listener even. It would have overloaded the listener, and it would have weakened the effect of the scripts and the performance. Um, the the kind of analog I have for this is is Douglas Adams. Douglas Adams, who wrote Hitchhiker's, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, um, he would often be asked what the significance of the number 42 was, um, which is, of course, the, the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Um, the answer to the ultimate question. And he constantly had to explain that the joke is that the answer to the ultimate question is a number. Um, if he'd picked a funny number, it would have lessened the effect of the original joke. So... The joke is that is the number itself. Um, the number is not funny. The number is just a number. Um, so that's a kind of roundabout way of uh, trying to trying to explain what I'm getting at. But an important lesson to learn, and it's a lesson that is hard learned as a as a show offy sound designer, uh, is that audio storytelling is a collaborative process. Um, you are one voice. Um, in this process. If you let your ego get in the way, if you um, push your, try to push yourself to the front and overshadow everything else, everybody suffers. Um, The writer and uh, the writer and the, and the actors and the, 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 the musicians, they will all suffer because their, the emphasis on what they are doing is being taken away by the sound design. The over the sound design is kind of elbowing its way to the front, um, and is kind of trying to hog all the attention, which is not collaborative at all. That's that's kind of bulldozing your way in, um, and letting your ego get to the front. And I I understand that need though. I understand that um, uh, drive. 
I get very excited about sound design if that wasn't already clear. Um, and it's natural to to when you have an idea to just be like, look, this is this is what I can do. Um, you you know, let me do this. I I can I can make this so big. I can make this so um, immersive. I can, I can make this so large. I can make this so, so alive. Um, but you need to remember that you're one voice in this story. You are. You everybody on the team is working together um, to try and tell a story, and 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 nobody is more important than the other and you need to remember that and 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 it's easy to forget i forget it all the time but it, it's the important thing to remember that audio is that audio storytelling is um collaborative and a phrase that um i picked up when i was making films was that um that you leave your ego at the door so everybody shows up for shooting and 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 you're, you're there to record audio and you do your job um, and when you are making music for a film you you know you make this music and and you're very proud of it and you send it over and if the director comes back and says this doesn't work you think you, do, you don't go but this is really good i think this works no you you go right okay what are your notes how can i make this better you are there to tell a story you're not there to you know showcase yourself um so Audio, telling, audio storytelling is collaborative. Leave your ego at the door. Important lesson, hard learned, easy to forget, but it's very important. Um, so those are my principles of sound design. Um, but there are exceptions. <laughs> um, I was very nervous about doing a uh, uh, sound design workshop because, first of all, I'm self-taught. I don't have any kind of formal training. So uh, I get sort of very... Um, nervous when i'm when i tell people my process because i have no idea how you know industry standard it is or how right it is i guess um but also as well narrowing things down to principles um kind of is restrictive and and it with sound design it's important to take thing everything on a kind of case by case basis um so, like I'm kind of saying here, not everything has to push boundaries. Um, with the tower, the, the sound design in the tower is all passive. Um, but that was kind of the plan with that show. The idea behind the tower was that music and um, the music and the, the the voice acting were going to carry the the kind of narrative weight of that story, and 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 the the, the sound design was there to just kind of set the. Um, set the tone and kind of dress set dressing basically kind of make make the world feel a little bit more alive um but on the other hand not everything has to be balanced either um the 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 sound design and the music in in, in dungeon economic model are absolutely obnoxious um it's it's and it's been an audio playground for me editing dungeon economic model and there it's in your face and 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 and, and you know it's it's loud and it's it's you know, it's under absolutely everything and there's so much of it. It's kind of a little bit of a sensory overload. But that was kind of the idea from the start. You know, that was always the plan. There's no passive sound design in Dungeon Economic Model. It's all it's all active sound design. So as much as these are the things that I ask myself and these are the things I consider when I'm um, designing um, sound for audio fiction or podcasting, um, you do have to think about the story you are telling. Um, but one thing that I will say you should do for absolutely every single project that you do is to experiment and and, and play with storytelling, with um, sound design and, and, and audio storytelling. Uh, sometimes you'll get a brief through um, or you'll get a script through to do sound design for and you won't know how to do it. You you will It'll be completely different from what you normally do. Um, I'm editing an episode of uh, a series right now um, that uh, at, the, at the time I'm recording this, um, it'll hopefully be out by the time I release this. Um, but it's all it's all fantasy. It's fantasy. It's all wizards and witches, and um, it takes place in a in a fantasy kingdom. I've never done a fantasy. Um, audio fiction show before. I've only ever done you know science fiction. So, my, you know, when scripts like that comes through, your first sort of thing, feeling is to be, oh no, I can't do this. I, I, I don't know how to do this. How am I gonna, how am I gonna design this? 
But then you calm down, you think about the principles, and your second thought is, well, okay, I don't know how to do this, but that means we get to learn how to. You know, you, you get to do sound design in a way that you've not done before. And that's always exciting. And and there is nothing but gain, nothing but, you know, knowledge and, and learning and advantage to be gained from that. Um, and also, m- most of all as well, is, is to have fun with it. So, sound design is, is, is a magic trick um, in audio fiction. And you should try and have fun with what you're doing. Uh, before I came to audio fiction, like I said, I worked in film. And for the most part in, uh, I don't know how much you know about independent um, micro-budget Scottish short films, but uh, there's not a lot of not a lot of sound design, a lot of creative sound design. It's lots of doors opening and, and doors closing and leveling dialogue and um, cleaning up messy audio files and trying to filter out car noise, traffic noises in the background. It's not a lot of fun. And I think that's why I came to audio fiction was because I knew that there was fun to be had with sound and and, and audio storytelling. So it's a very privileged job to be a sound designer um, for audio fiction. Um, It's an extremely creative space and there's so much you can do with very, very little. And that's an immense amount of fun. And you should try and carry that into everything that you do. Um... So that's kind of that's kind of it for me. So I I really like sound design <laughs> and audio storytelling. If you if you uh, hadn't worked that out by by this point in the in the in the workshop, um, audio story audio storytelling is fueled by imagination from everyone involved in the process, and that includes the listener. Um, you know, sounds carry images. Sounds carry memories. Um, this is kind of a common thing where you speak to people who listen to audio fiction and and a lot of the time they can remember really vividly where they were or what they were doing when they were listening to to that show. Like I always associate listening to We Fix Space Junk with um, uh, my first London podcast festival or and uh, I also associate it with um, traveling down to Oxford from Glasgow to see Victoriosity for the first time, the Victoriosity live show, um, where I first met uh, a lot of a lot of my friends that also work in audio fiction um and that again that's very powerful and that's um a wonderful opportunity to be able to be a part of that kind of tapestry um everybody you know if if you hear a horse everybody will picture a different horse if you put the sound of of beach everyone will picture a different beach and it's a very intimate relationship to have with a listener and it's a very privileged one and it's one that should never be taken for granted um sound design provides an outline for for a listener it provides an outline of what's around the the, the voices for the listener to color in and the clearer the outline that you make um and and the more shapes and spaces you put in to the sound design, the more colourful and and vivid the uh, the full picture is going to be for the listener, and and the stronger it will resonate with them. I really like this ability because, um, or or you know, being able to to, to do this because um, I'm, you know, I can't draw at all. I I, I wish I could. Um, I, I I can't draw pictures, and I, I can't um, make video games either. Um, but I can. But if you say, you know, this takes place in a in a shop, I can make a space sound like a shop. Um, if you say, you know, make a spaceship, I can make a spaceship. You know, I can paint with audio. And that's a very uh, privileged thing to be able to do. And uh, so thank you for thank you for watching this video. Um, I hope it was helpful in some way. I hope it has inspired you in some way. Um, please let me know if you enjoyed it. Please let me know if you didn't enjoy it. Um, and please tell me why you didn't enjoy it so I can I can do better in the future. Um, thank you. Uh, so again, if you have any questions, please uh, leave a comment down below um, or uh, ask me on Twitter. So I have a lot of Twitters. 
I have a lot of Twitters. Uh, if you're asking me questions, um, probably the best thing to do is to uh, tweet at me at DevRobase or Tin Can Audio. Um, uh, if you're interested in following any of the shows that I've talked about today, there's Middle Below and the Dungeon Economic Model all have Twitter accounts. Um, and if you have a question and you don't, or you don't have Twitter, uh, feel free to email me. I always enjoy getting emails from people. If you have a show of your own, email me about it. I, I always love hearing what other people are making. Um, and yeah, if you're interested in any of the things you've heard today and you think, oh, that sounds kind of interesting. I want to check that out, um, which I hope you do. <laughs> uh, you can visit my website at tincanaudio.co.uk. Um, so thank you very much uh, for watching. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope you have a great day. My name is David Devereaux. And uh, yeah, thank you for watching. <laughs>